Um, thanks to AWARE for asking me to speak today on this topic, um, eating disorders and depression. So to begin, um, then, to think more closely about the two conditions and how they may interact, um, I think it might be helpful to think about them both from this um, perspective of a spectrum. So if we think about eating disorders first, in many ways we can all relate to and can understand to a certain extent what disordered eating is, because to a certain extent we all engage in it. None of us um, eat the same way every day. And the way we feel each day, our mood and how we feel, does affect how we feed ourselves. So if we think of this spectrum, and as you'll see there, I've put normal disordered eating at one end of the spectrum. And if we put eating disorder at the other end, where we cross from one side to the other, you can see there is where compulsion comes into the picture. So for example, when someone suffers a bereavement and loses their appetite, we don't necessarily think that that person has an eating disorder, but rather we might think that that's quite a normal reaction to grief. But when we cross over into the eating disorder side of this spectrum, <laughs> that is when compulsion comes into the picture, this is when the person no longer consciously chooses not to eat, for example, but rather they feel compelled to not eat in order to feel okay and in order to mediate their feelings of anxiety. So when a person feels they must engage in the disordered eating behaviour in order to feel okay and able to cope, then we're more in the realm of an eating disorder rather than it being normal disordered eating. And I think we can think about depression in a similar way. We can all experience a low mood, feeling down, a sense of hopelessness, and negative feelings about ourselves. But when these feelings are no, longer, no longer appear to be within our control, and when we become buried deep down in them, when our life has that shadow of blackness over it, then we're more in the realm of a clinical diagnosis of depression, rather than just feeling down or feeling depressed, as many people express from time to time. So I find this helpful as a way of orientating myself with regard to what I'm dealing with when someone presents with either an eating disorder or depression or features of the two. So eating disorders and depression have many of the same features and it's therefore quite difficult to try and understand what are distinctly depressive dis symptoms and what are eating disorder symptoms. So I thought I'd pull out a few examples of similar features and how they might differ depending on which clinical picture we're looking at. So whether we're thinking about somebody who has depression or somebody who has an eating disorder. So one feature would be this extreme and pervasive negative thinking. So you'll hear terms like global negative thinking, hopelessness, recurrent thoughts about death and dying, suicidal thoughts and plans. In eating disorders, this will primarily be concerned with eating, shape and weight, although when a person goes into these concerns more deeply, they will also be knotted together with how they feel about themselves, but the way that they're expressed is, is focused on the eating, the shape concerns, and the focus on weight, and you know, being super um, conscious of what that number might be. Whereas in depression, this will be much broader in content and it won't be confined to just eating shape and weight. Okay. Another similar feature is um, undue guilt about events and circumstances. Um, and when we're talking about somebody with depression who's experiencing these they will be unrelated to the eating disorder psychopathology. So for a person with an eating disorder, there will be feelings of guilt associated with eating, which will then link to more deep-rooted feelings of guilt about being a person with wants, a person with needs, and a person who has desires. 
Whereas in depression, this deep-rooted guilt will be unrelated to the eating disorder psychopathology and will not be dependent on the way the person feeds themselves. Another similar feature is this decreased interest in socialising. So depression causes a person to withdraw from social interaction and narrows a person's world so that they feel themselves to be alone. Whereas when a person has an eating disorder, this withdrawal from the world will be a consequence of trying to maintain the disordered eating rules predominantly. So when a person develops an eating disorder, they start to develop this kind of bank of rules around their routine around eating um, and what they do every day. And because the thinking becomes so distorted and they find it so difficult to make decisions because every little decision um, has this mo- a sense of a monumental effect and um, is linked to their sense of you know, worth and a sense of who they are as a person, they limit those choices uh, so that they don't have to think about those things all the time. And as a consequence of that limiting, then their world will become narrowed and they withdraw from social interaction, they withdraw from socialising, and they try to do the same thing every day because that feels easier. So, you know, for a person with an eating disorder, the withdrawal from the world is due to them trying to adhere to the eating disorder rules, whereas in depression, um, it's um, maybe for a different reason. Um, It's because they feel that um, they can't engage with the world, that, that the, there's too much of an effort, that it's too difficult for them. Okay? Um, okay. So the next feature um, is this idea of it being difficult to make decisions. And when we're thinking about um, a person with an eating disorder this difficulty making decisions will be driven by the inflexible thinking that comes with the eating disorder that's centred on a person adhering to the eating disorder rules, which, as I said, cause even the smallest decision to have perceived life-threatening consequences, as in the person may feel that if they eat a meal, their world will fall apart. Whereas in depression, this difficulty making decision comes from a lack of motivation and that withdrawal from life I just spoke about um, due to this kind of procrastination and a feeling of being unable to make a decision and cope with the consequences. Then another similar feature is this idea of neglect of personal appearance or neglect of the self, really. Um, Whereas often a person with an eating disorder will have a high level of preoccupation with their appearance and often a distorted body image. Um, Whereas in depression there is a lack of motivation to look after oneself and this kind of lethargy about fulfilling normal, um, normal ways that we look after ourselves. Okay. So the question then is to begin to think about which, that is the eating disorder or depression, is the primary problem for the person. For example, is this person suffering with a clinical depression, which has been overtaken by an eating disorder, or are the depressive symptoms as a consequence of the eating disorder itself? Both situations are possible. Sometimes a person has an underlying clinical depression to their eating disorder, and sometimes a person can experience the symptoms of depression as a consequence of their eating disorder. And this is why it's really important um, to listen to what the person has to say about what they're going through. Because it's not until you begin to hear how these things are interacting with each other and within the person that you begin to get an idea of which was coming first and which the person needs to address in order to move forward in either the eating disorder or trying to figure out what's going on in the depression. At BodyWise, we think of an eating disorder as a coping mechanism, a destructive coping mechanism, but a coping mechanism nonetheless. 
This means that a person develops an eating disorder as a reaction to the way they're feeling, the way they are feeling about themselves, as a way of answering a fundamental question they have about who they are, so a question about their sense of self and the way they see themselves in the world and the way they perceive that others see them in the world as well. The eating disorder at first works well as a coping mechanism. It provides the person with an answer to this question about who they are. It can make a person feel powerful. It can make a person feel in control. And we have that kind of classic idea of everything else feeling out of control, but the person can control their food and their body, and that gives them a sense of control. Um, But I think that's just gleaming the top of it. There's a lot more going on than just the control issues in it. So the eating disorder um, boosts their self-esteem because it makes them feel better in themselves. It can make them feel better able to cope. And it brings a reassurance that they have found a way of coping with whatever the overwhelming feelings they are experiencing um, or the difficult feelings that they're experiencing. The problem is, is that it doesn't work and that very quickly as the person starts to use the eating disorder or use the control of their food and body in order to feel better, in order to feel okay, in order to feel in control, the more they need it in order to feel okay. And so without their conscious control, so to speak, the eating disorder itself begins to control the person. (coughs) They become to be at the mercy of it, at the mercy of the eating disorder. Okay? If it was simply a choice, they would be able to choose not to have it, but that doesn't happen, does it? Um, Trying to get out of it becomes extremely difficult, even when the person wants to get out of it. So even when they're at the point of acknowledging, yes, this is a problem, yes, I can't be living this way, Even at that point, the fear is still there, the difficulty changing their behaviours is still there, the distorted thoughts are still there. Yeah? So in this way, we can see that for some, an eating disorder can become a way of coping with the symptoms of depression. So if we look at anorexia, for example, when the person is in the full throes of this food restriction, which is characteristic of anorexia, And when the anorexia is working for them, their depressive symptoms will dissipate for a while because they have found a way of dealing with them. It is often only when the anorexia itself becomes too difficult to maintain, when the rules it sets about food restriction and exercise become almost impossible, that the person feels they are failing at it, so failing at the anorexia. It's only then that depressive symptoms can emerge. And that's something that I would come across all the time, that people who are really in the throes of the eating disorder um, you know, don't have a question about what's wrong with them and don't feel down and don't feel depressed. It's only when the eating disorder itself gets too tough for them to keep going and when they feel that they're failing at it, um, because often the person has all-or-nothing thinking and they're also usually quite, you know, focused on high achieving and to feel that they're failing at it, that they can't keep doing it, that it's only then that that depressive part can come out um, when they feel like it's not working for them. These depressive symptoms are then intensified by feelings of inadequacy (coughs) because the person is unable to meet the extraordinary demands of the anorexia. But depressive symptoms are also extremely common in people with binge eating disorder because the binge eating that is the main behavioural feature of binge eating disorder brings with it strong feelings of guilt, shame and worthlessness. And when we look at the cycle of binge eating disorder, depression is, and shame and guilt are, is a huge aspect to that cycle. And in many ways, it's part of the cycle that keeps the person hooked into that cycle and makes it really difficult for them to break out of it Um, because they often feel you know they're often caught up in this diet debate and diet talk and so they feel 
and the messages that we all get are that you'll feel better if you can find the right diet for you. And so the depressive feelings are a huge feature of binge eating disorder. And for the person with bulimia, they experience much more volatility with regard to how they're feeling because they swing really quite wildly between feeling in control and feeling out of control. And that would be one of the features of bulimia. Whereas anorexia is all about control and restriction, bulimia is much more swinging between the two. And the person can feel much more at the mercy of you know, these overwhelming feelings that you know, go with it. And so the depressive symptoms are really common with it. Um, and then the person would use the, the purging, which is a feature of bulimia, as a way of dealing with the depressive symptoms. Okay? In these situations where the depressive symptoms are part of and sometimes as a result of the eating disorder, then the treatment of the eating disorder as a primary focus of treatment um, should work to alleviate these symptoms. (coughs) So as the person goes through treatment and begins to let go of the eating disorder and begins to figure out the whys of the eating disorder, this will also address the underlying feelings of hopelessness, sadness and depression that come with it. In fact, a huge part of recovery from an eating disorder is helping the person to tolerate feeling low and feeling sad or feeling angry without having to resort to the disordered eating behaviour in order to feel okay. However, it also can be the case that there is a clinical depression that underlies and precedes the development of the eating disorder. And when this is the case, it is important that the depression is dealt with also as an entity in itself for working through in treatment because it can function to disrupt the recovery process from an eating disorder by undermining constantly the person's motivation to let go of the eating disorder. And also it can become a huge barrier to change. Okay? And sometimes, you know, parents would ring... Um, and I was talking to a mum last week and she was talking about her daughter who had, um, what eating disorder did she have? Um, I think it was anorexia. But she said, you know, even before this, even before this developed, she was depressed. She was down. Um, and this is just making it all worse. So then, you, you know, in that kind of situation, you're presented with the complexity of it. You know, the eating disorder is one part, but there must have been something going on before it developed um, that led her to feeling like that beforehand. So the work would need to go there as well. You know, to bring that person out of it, the work would not only need to focus on the eating disorder part, it will need to focus also on, well, what was there beforehand as well. Yeah? Does that make sense? So the depressive thinking can exacerbate a sense of hopelessness on the part of the person about the possibility of change. It can also be the case that where progress is not being made at a certain point in the recovery from an eating disorder, that this may be due to an underlying depression. And so it is important for the clinician to be aware of the complexities of both conditions and how they interact with each other. Lapse and relapse are always aspects of the recovery process. And it's also important to be able to identify when a lapse is being caused by depressive symptoms and thinking and address these as a way of finding a way forward. And, you know, it's always part, it's always, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Like that um, analogy of the tide coming in. You know, it, it, the tide is moving forward, but it comes in and it goes out and it comes in and it goes out, but the general thrust is in. Or when it's going out, the thrust is out. But it's moving in one direction. So there's always that forward and backwards. And it's really important that when you're working with somebody or when you're going through it or when you're supporting somebody going through it, that when there is a backwards turn, that you look and see why is that? What's going on? And that that's framed in a positive way. Because that is a learning opportunity. You know, that is gold when you're working with somebody because then you can see um, what do they need in place, what isn't being addressed, 
yeah, all of those parts. So they're really important. And when depression is added into the mix of all that, it's even more important to understand the whys of that. So depending on the treatment model that a person is engaged in, this process will take various forms. For example, it may be that medication is used to reduce the depressive symptoms, which will allow the process of change in terms of the recovery from an eating disorder to take place. And I would have heard of that, you know, where somebody goes on medication for a period of time um, and then they come off it and, you know, they move forward. Um, If the person is working with a psychotherapist, there may be a considerable amount of time talking out and working through the causes of and the ways in which the depression is interacting with the person's life, which will free up the person in the sense that it will provide them with a stronger foundation upon which to begin to address the eating disorder symptoms. So maybe just to kind of sum up the points that I've made... um, It's very common for eating disorders and depression to coexist. It's important to think about whether the depressive symptoms are as as a result of the eating disorder or whether there is an underlying depression to the eating disorder. Often depressive symptoms won't be noticeable at first and especially when the eating disorder is working for the person as a coping mechanism, they might not be noticeable at all. The depressive symptoms often only become apparent as the person struggles to live by the eating disorder rules and the eating disorder itself as a coping mechanism starts to fail them. If the depressive symptoms are bound up with the eating disorder as the person goes through the recovery process of of the eating disorder, these depressive symptoms will be addressed and the person will come out of them to a more balanced and eating disorder free way of living. If the depression is an underlying condition, then it is important to understand that many of the symptoms can disrupt the recovery process from an eating disorder and can act as a barrier to change. When this is the case, these symptoms need to be addressed for the person to be able to continue with the eating disorder treatment. Depending on who is treating the person, different approaches will be taken with regard to how all of this happens. So at BodyWise, we do not advocate any one form of treatment. We really believe that different things work for different people. So for anyone who is struggling, it is important that you know that it is okay for you to try and find a way forward that works for you. A way forward that you can trust a person to work with um, that you feel you can trust and that you can work with, and also to know that you know places like BodyWise and Aware are here to support you at whatever stage that you're at. We can listen and we can never tell anyone what they should do. We pass no judgment and our focus is in helping each and every person to find their own way through what they're experiencing at a pace that suits them. And that's just a list of the support services that we have and that are available from our organization. Um, And maybe it's important to say that on all of our support services, we don't talk about food and we don't talk about weight and we don't get into the specifics or the nitty gritty of what people are doing. Our focus is on how everyone is feeling about what they're doing. Okay, and trying to help people to articulate all of those thoughts that are in their head, that fight that's going on. Because until they can put words on it and until they can hear, you know, what's going on in their head, it can be very difficult for them to deal with it. And part of the recovery process is helping a person to do that. So we have a helpline which is open to everybody. We have support groups in Dublin, Carlow and Sligo and we have two types of support groups, one for people with eating disorders and one for family and friends. We have a support email which is open to everybody and we have online support groups for people who have an eating disorder. We have an over 18s group and an under 18s group and all the information is available at our website. Okay, thank you. So I'm Gillian. I'm the clinical psychologist that works on the eating disorder ward 
in St. Pat's here. So I'm going to talk today uh, about a way that I think about uh, depression and eating disorders or a way uh, that we can understand uh, how these two difficulties can coexist uh, together. Uh, And hopefully uh, my talk will give you some information um, that will help you think about how uh, depression or eating disorders have developed as a way for people to survive uh, in their environments um, and how sometimes as humans our survival methods uh, have ended up with unintended or unhelpful consequences. Um, and the link I'm going to be talking about uh, is something that we all experience. Uh, it's the link of our emotions. Um, so some people will have got sheets that I'm sending around at the minute, uh, and there's more being photocopied for those of you who haven't. Uh, but I would invite you, if you'd like to, if you want to, uh, to have a think about yourself during this talk, because depression and eating disorders, they don't affect just one group of people, they can affect any of us. Um, And it's important maybe to think about our own coping methods uh, and the intended consequences and the unintended consequences of those coping mechanisms because they can help us understand uh, how other people are feeling uh, or the struggles that other people are going through at any point in time. So the model I'm going to talk about today, uh, it's a psychological model and it's called compassion-focused therapy. Uh, And it's been devised over about 20 years uh, by two psychologists, or actually by a number of psychologists. Uh, Professor Paul Gilbert uh, came up with the model uh, initially and Dr. Ken Gauz developed it uh, further um, to encompass eating disorders. So that will be the model I'll be focusing on mainly today. Um, I'm not going to focus on the therapy part of the model. Uh, Instead, I'm going to try and focus on giving an understanding um, of, as I mentioned, the links and uh, of the reasons why uh, different coping strategies develop. And this is something I use to inform my thinking uh, and that psychologists use to inform their thinking. Not all of them. Uh, So just as a provisio before I start, I'm not saying that this is the only model or that it's the model that's going to suit any individual here. It may not. It's just one way of thinking. So I'm hoping to spark a little bit of curiosity. Um, I'm going to ask everyone not to think of depression and eating disorders as single entities. So there is no such thing as an experience of an eating disorder or an experience of depression. There is an individual's experience that will be formed by their own unique life, by their genetic makeup, by their life experiences, by how they perceive the world. Um, However, We are also all human beings, so we're all connected. Um, So the first thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about in a really clunky way because I'm not a biologist, is evolution. Okay, So this is going to be a two-minute whiz through uh, of evolution. Uh, I'm going to talk about this amazing structure, which is the human brain. Uh, And what uh, people, researchers, think uh, is that the human brain has developed in three different stages. So the first stage uh, of the human brain uh, is our reptilian brain. So this is our, the oldest part of our brain, uh, and it controls our vital functions. So it controls our heart rate, it controls our breath, and all it really wants is to keep us alive. Okay? It wants us to survive. That's its main focus. And it also wants to keep the species going, okay? So two functions there of that reptilian brain. It's really, really old, about 550 million years, they reckon. The next part of our brain, and actually just to say, this survival brain, it's in touch with a lot of our really basic emotions, uh, those emotions like anxiety or anger, so those survival emotions. Um, The next part of our brain then... uh, 
that developed uh, was our mammalian brain, our mammal brain. Okay, so what changed around that time um, is our orientation. So we stopped just being out for ourselves and we started looking out for other members of our tribe. Um, so we came, became very sensitive to our caregivers, to the reactions of those around us, because we figured out that actually that would help us survive. Um, so around the time this brain developed, we became, uh, or expressions of care and warmth became very important to us. It became very important in order for us to feel safe and to feel soothed, Okay. So these two parts of our brain together are called our old brain. Okay, so it's the older part of our brain. And then our new brain, it's only about two or three million years old, developed. And this is what's called our human brain. Um, so it is the part of the brain that's responsible for our higher order functions. So for things like language, for abstract thought, problem solving, rumination, mindfulness. It is the part of our brain that gives us the I, okay? So I know that I am, and that is my human brain that tells me um, that that is the case. It also helps us multitask and gives us lots of problems. Um, so just thinking about these three parts of our brain, they all interact all the time. Um, and if we're to think about the old brain and the new brain, we've got a brain that really wants to survive, and then we've got this higher order brain, and the two of them are interacting all the time. So how does this work? Okay. So I'm going to think about me today. And just as an aside, in a few minutes I'm going to talk about cultural influences and the way culture influences eating disorders. And I thought this was an interesting cartoon, because I googled woman, cartoon woman, and this is the woman that came up, okay? And in general, most of the cartoon figures looked like this, um, and no woman looks like this, okay? Um, and I then googled a uh, woman, cartoon, proportionally shaped woman, and what came up was all kind of picture drawing, you know, like it, it didn't look like a cartoon. So I went for this one because I thought it was an important point. It's an important cultural point that these are the images we get all the time. Okay, anyway, this is me. Uh, and I'm coming in here today and I'm giving this talk, okay? And I walk into the room and I feel one of those old survival emotions. Um, so I feel anxious um, because I see you guys, okay? I have 80 people looking down here at me, okay? However, okay, so my old brain is saying, anxiety, Gillian, run. My new brain is able to say to me, Gillian, you're okay, you've prepared, you've got slides, you've got your notes, you've done this before, I'm sure these people are nice people and they're interested. So I'm able to stay, okay? My new brain is helping me. If I had come in here and I had seen this, my old brain would have just told me to get out of here, okay? A black widow would have the old brain would have overrode my new brain, okay? It's a really helpful strategy of the old brain when we're in danger, okay? So this would have been me. Okay. Where we run into difficulties sometimes is that we live in a world that's developing at the speed of light, okay? Um, and we're working with uh, a machine that's two or three million years old, so it doesn't always catch up with what's happening. My old brain, or my, so my brain, which is an old machine, um, when it perceives danger, it always thinks of the danger as life-threatening. But a lot of time, nowadays, danger is social danger. But my machine doesn't know that, and I can't go back and reprogram it. 
uh, because I need to work with what I've got. Evolution only goes one direction, which is forward. That doesn't mean I can't change it. It just means it's going to be really hard. And it's going to catch me out at times because it's kind of tricky, okay? Um, so, uh, the other thing to say is the reptilian brain is our default mechanism. It's the one that's always going to take over because it wants us to survive. Okay. So, I'm now going to talk about uh, the model. Um, and if we think about the reptilian brain, um, it being our default brain, I'm going to start with this threat circle. Okay? In this model, this compassion model, we think about our reactions in relation to how they make us feel and in relation to what they make us do or what they make us want to do. This model explains how we control or regulate our emotions so that we can feel good about ourselves and feel safe in this world that we live in. So researchers think that we have evolved three different systems of regulating our emotions, which emerge depending on what's happening. Okay? So I mentioned going into threat because of feeling anxious. So that was that circle. Um, for anyone who's done any compassion uh, work, I then did my soothing rhythm breathing and kind of was going between threat and soothe. Okay? Uh, now up here I'm in drive. I'm going to explain what each of these systems do. So, threat is our reptilian brain. It's the one that kicks in really, really easily. Um, and it is associated with emotions that I call survival emotions that sometimes we refer to as the negative emotions, okay? Anxiety, sadness, anger, shame, jealousy, envy, those sort of emotions. It's also associated with different types of behaviours or different types of reactions. So I'm sure we've all heard of fight or flight. Um, some people might have heard of freeze, which is when we're so frightened in our environment that there isn't anything we can do. We feel paralysed. Um, sometimes we appease, we give in, okay? Uh, or we avoid. We just try and, and get away. So that is the threat. Uh, shame is here uh, highlighted because shame, it turns out, is a really important emotion in both depression and in eating disorders. And it's one uh, that can cause people a lot of difficulty. Uh, and it's a really painful emotion. Uh, it's a really hard one. And it makes us want to hide. It makes us want to not tell people what's happening. So it can be quite a dangerous one. Um, the next system then is our drive system. And our drive system is one of two positive systems that we have. Uh, and it's quite an activating system. So it's associated with pleasure and with achievement. Um, so it's the system that uh, would be activated uh, if you passed your driving test or if you won the lottery. Um, so you'd get an increased heart rate, nice physical sensations. But actually, physical sensations are very close to some of the threat physical sensations of anxiety. The reason pride is highlighted is because pride is another emotion that's a positive emotion, but that can come up in the early stages of an eating disorder. And that's one of the maintaining factors at times. And I'm going to come back to that in, in a little while. The final system is our soothe system. And this is our system that helps us feel safe and helps us feel content and helps us feel relaxed. It's a system that deactivates and slows down the body. So it's not kind of a bore, boredom system. It's more of a, this just feels okay, I feel right in myself. Um, and it's one that develops throughout life. Uh, and it's one that often develops in the context of our relationships with others. So hopefully, if you've had good relationships and good experiences of being cared for, over time, you will learn how to care for yourself. You'll learn how to validate or say, my emotions are okay. And you'll learn how to soothe them. For some people, they haven't had that experience, and that's not their fault. We don't get to choose when we're born or where we're born or the people in the environment that we're 
born into or the different factors that are going on uh, in the world or in our lives. We don't get to choose that. We just get to be born, we get to have the brain we have, and we have to do the best that we can. Um, so for anyone who's kind of thinking, oh, you know, I didn't have those kind of relationships that helped me build that system, that's okay because you can learn them. Our brain is really, really good at learning new techniques. It's just hard, uh, but it can be done. So I've passed around, or hopefully everyone has, uh, a two-sided sheet. So one of the sides of the sheet is blank. So, yeah. And it's just an exercise. So the idea here is if you have had any sort of difficulties in your life, it's quite likely that your threat system has gotten bigger, okay? So ideally, in the previous slide, we saw the three circles being the same size and we saw a nice connection between them. So that's the ideal, that we're able to move from threat when we're feeling sad or bothered or anxious. We're able to soothe ourselves and then when we need to get something done, we can get over to drive and then sometimes we're going to go back into threat, but we can get out of it and we've got that nice three-way system. But if that wasn't the case, then... For reasons of necessity, you've had to survive um, and your threat system has had to get bigger because it's had to be on alert. Um, so for anyone who'd like to, I'd invite you to draw your three circles, whatever size you think they are. We're not going to share this or talk about it or maybe you'll choose to do it later. But just to think about what are the things in your life that put you into threat what are the things that put you into drive, that feeling of doing really well? And what are the things that you have that you know can soothe you? So for some of us, it's going to be relationships. For some of us, it will be animals. For some of us, it will be things like a hot bath or a nice cup of coffee. But it's important for all of us to start figuring it out. What does it for me? Because it becomes really, really important, particularly when life gets a bit tough or a bit rough. So as I mentioned, for some of us, um, we've had to develop coping mechanisms to survive. Um, and in the compassion-focused model, we can see both depression and eating disorders as strategies that a person uses when they are doing the best that they can when trying to cope with really difficult emotions. So... What I'm going to do is I'm going to take us through a hypothetical case, okay? So I'm just going to show you how I might think about a case um, and how we can see the links of where an eating disorder or depression uh, might come up for someone and how it is understandable that this might happen and how they are doing the best that they can, um, but how their coping strategies might trip them up. So again, on the other side of your sheet there is a grey piece of paper and it's just a blank one of what I'm going to go through um, and if you're interested you can write it up or think about yourself um, but again it's, it's just for your own interest. Okay so we all have certain early experiences in our life that bring up strong emotions. So if I was to ask anyone in this room or you were to ask me we can all access times in our life where we felt a strong emotion, maybe joy, maybe sadness, maybe anger, maybe anxiety. So let's think about this case, okay? Um, so this is just one I made up. Um, but what about, so let's imagine that this is a woman. What about a woman who was compared unfavorably to her sister when she was younger? What about if in her home academics were really valued um, and the need to get a good job um, was kind of, you know, that, that was the thing to do. What about if this woman had an experience of being bullied or being excluded at school? And what about if the culture, so back to culture, do you remember from earlier about the cartoon? But what about if the culture that she grew up in was one about keeping up appearances? We don't show our emotions around here, okay? So 
if we're to think about this, we could think about, for someone, maybe, these kind of experiences might evoke a feeling of shame, okay, for any of us. So we all have fears in this world. It's natural, that's how we survive, that's how our brain works. And we have fears about us, about how I experience myself. So let's think about this case. How might this woman experience herself? So she might experience herself as not being good enough. And she might feel alone. And she might think I'm different. Okay? We also have fears about other people. Again, it's natural. It's how we survive in the world. We need to be a little bit alert um, to how we're perceived by others. So let's think about this woman. Given her experiences, it's understandable that her fears about others might be that other people are hurtful um, or critical or other people reject me. She may also feel other people's liking is conditional. I have to do this in order to be liked. Okay, So she's going to develop coping strategies just like we all have to do to survive in this world. So let's think of some of the ones she could uh, pick. Um, So internally, okay? So she might decide that feeling alone really doesn't feel that great, and that's understandable. So she might decide to try and avoid her negative feelings, to try and cut off from them, okay? That's something our threat system can do. It can distance us from those kind of feelings. So that works. That helps. She might decide that she's going to be perfect because then she's going to get the good job um, and she's not going to be compared unfavorably anymore. Okay? So she starts feeling positive about that because achievement feels really good. It's natural that we feel good when we achieve. She's getting into her drive system. She might get praise from those around her and that feels pretty good as well. She might also start to feel, I'm in control. Okay, so she starts to to notice that she can control things around her um, by making sure that she's doing things to the standard that she wants to do them. Externally, then, maybe she'll decide not to ask for things because she doesn't want to be disappointed. Um, And that keeps her safe. She doesn't have to be disappointed then. She can protect herself. And maybe she'll decide to please others because then she'll maintain their liking and avoids conflict which will bring her into threat. But every coping strategy we develop has an intended consequence and an unintended consequence. What about if she also decides to focus her self-esteem on something she can control? To focus it on being able to control her food. And initially, when you start to lose weight, you feel good. You might get positive attention. Again, that feeling of being in control. And I mentioned pride earlier on. So you might start to feel proud. I can do this and I can do this well. Okay. So back to the unintended consequences. So internal unintended consequences of not feeling. You start to feel numb after a while. Um, And you start to lose kind of an ability to recognize what it is that you need or what it is that you want because it turns out that our emotions are really important for giving us information about what we like and what we don't like. And if you lose the negative ones, you lose the positive ones too. So we don't get to decide which ones we keep and which ones we give away. Perfection. We can't stay perfect. No matter how hard we try, we will always fall off that pedestal. So we'll go from being in drive, which is how we feel when we're in perfection, back down to threat. But if I've learned a way to get out of threat, which is being perfectionistic, I'm going to try even harder. So I get a circle or a cycle going. It's also really tiring to have to be perfect all the time. And if you can't stay perfect, you end up blaming yourself or being critical of yourself. Restricting. So restricting, which feels good initially, 
then starts to become rule governed and it starts to dictate what you can and what you can't do. And the goalposts keep moving. So you set yourself a goal initially and then you reach it, but actually it's not good enough. You have to reach another one. And then it feels like you can't stop. It also causes things like withdrawal. So it causes you to stop doing the things that you liked doing. So maybe meeting up with friends or doing things that you enjoy doing because now you're doing something else. Um, it, when the effects of starvation kick in, well, maybe you've no energy. Um, maybe your mood drops. Maybe your sleep become dis- becomes disturbed. So those physical consequences start to kick in. The other thing about an eating disorder is it gets tied up in your identity because initially it helps you to feel good. So it becomes linked with your sense of self-worth and your sense of self-esteem. But then it's hard to know which is which. Which am I and which is the eating disorder? Or am I the eating disorder? And that feels really lonely. Um, For some people it will also bring up a feeling of shame. I don't want to do this anymore. It doesn't feel good. Conflict. It's hurting people around me. Not asking for things. Um, I've no one to talk to then, and I can't tell them what's going on in my life. So that soothe system that I spoke about that's so important for us um, as humans, it's hard to get into it because it feels like I can't connect with others. Pleasing others all the time. Um, eventually I'm going to start feeling resentful because that doesn't feel good that my needs aren't being met. But also I'm going to start thinking that my needs aren't as important as the needs of those around me. So then it's harder to ask for them to be met. So I don't know if people, as I was going through this, noticed anything, but a lot of the unintended consequences um, of an eating disorder may actually come up in depression. Okay. So this is where we really start seeing the links. Also in how we start relating to yourself. So self-criticism, I'm not doing it well enough. Blame, feeling weak. And the ways we start relating to it, whoops, Uh-oh. what did I do? There we go. The ways we start relating to ourselves feed back into the coping strategies. Okay, so we get a cycle going and it's hard to break out of. It's tough. Um, So we can see that an emotion like shame can really link the experiences of depression and eating disorders. Um, We can see how they're a survival behaviour. They help us survive in this world, but they end up catching us out because of our tricky brain that we didn't choose. Um, But that tricky brain that I mentioned right back at the start, it's constantly evolving. That direction going forward is a really helpful thing as well as the thing that catches us out or trips it up because we can learn new ways to relate to ourselves. We can learn new ways to get into our soothe system, new ways to identify ourselves. And that's about redressing the balance. So in something like compassion-focused therapy, what we try to do is develop the soothe system. We say the threat system is good enough. That's done its job. It's helped us survive. Um, it's, it's not that the threat system has tried to hurt us. It's tried to do its best. But now we need to focus on that other system, on the soothe system, um, and on developing the ability to be compassionate towards ourselves. Um, because oftentimes we're pretty good at putting ourselves down or at blaming ourselves for things. Um, so... That's the tool we use. We use compassion and we try and teach people compassion. And I know maybe some people are thinking, you know, wait a minute, you're telling me I have to be nicer to myself? Are you kidding me? Do you know how many times I've heard that? Um, That's not the case. That's not what I'm saying. Well, it is and it isn't. Um, Because this is really hard. It turns out 
that in order to be compassionate, we have to risk being vulnerable. And we have to risk being vulnerable with emotions that don't want us to be vulnerable because they have developed to keep us safe and to guard us from that. Uh, And I was thinking about this talk and I was thinking about shame and I was thinking about my own experiences of shame. Um, And I said I'd share one with you because for me it's a good example, a really small example of what happens when we're in the throes of shame and someone tries to give us compassion. So uh, when I finished college, I had a job, and it was a really tough job. And one day, um, I was with a group of my peers, and uh, for some reason, my boss started shaming me in front of everyone. So started giving out to me and saying I wasn't good enough and um, that I hadn't done this right and that people didn't like me. And I can remember sitting there and it probably went on for, it felt like an hour, it was probably about 10 minutes. Um, But as he went through it, I remember, and I still remember it now, so remember the strong emotions I spoke about? I remember what my body did. So it started kind of getting really tense and strong and holding itself together as the emotion started to come up inside of it. Um, and at times then I started to move away and I was in disbelief. I was kind of saying, what is he talking about? I don't understand this. Okay, So my threat brain was trying to help me figure things out. What is going on here? Um, And then I just started saying to myself, just get through it, just get through it. And I did. And I was fine. I was sat there and I was all held together and it was going okay. And he left the room. And one of my friends turned to me and put his hand on my shoulder and said, Gillian, are you okay? Okay. And that was it for me. I couldn't hold it together anymore because that act of kindness and understanding validated my pain which I hadn't been able to understand before and that's a really really difficult thing to do so then I got really really upset okay so I was able to leave and collect myself and now use it as an anecdote so you know every cloud Uh, (laughs) but it was a really really difficult experience and that is one tiny experience so imagine that woman that I spoke about who had years of that experience and now we're asking her to be vulnerable. It's not easy and it does suck, okay? Um, But it's worth it. It's worth it for people to come through it um, and actually to be able to soothe themselves. Okay, so that's me. Thank you very much.